My name is uh, Albert Bond, and uh, I'm, uh, I will tell you now a bit about our work on uh, IgA antibody profiling in breast milk in SARS-CoV-2 infected individuals. I will also try to put this story a little bit in the bigger picture of what we at the Hack Lab started to call our Ig de novo sequencing task force. So previously, when I uh, started the presentation about this uh, topic, I used this example of Ebola, uh, where it took almost two decades to go from an infection of a patient to the uh, development of a monoclonal antibody that was being used in uh, therapy. But then came SARS-CoV-2, and uh, you're probably very well aware that uh, already within one year, uh, there was a uh, monoclonal antibody treatment um, authorized by the FDA for the treatment of COVID-19. And monoclonal antibody therapy has a great potential in the absence of, or in addition to uh, vaccines when patients do not, or not yet, have their own antibodies. So the question then is, how do people get the sequences for these uh, monoclonals. So there are several options, and the most common ones are depicted here in panels B and C. Um, mice or human individuals can be vaccinated or exposed to the pathogen, and then B cells from these uh, uh, patients or mice can be extracted and the sequence can be determined. And the more human a sequence is, the lower the chance of adverse side reactions. So nowadays, the mice are humanized, carrying the human Ig gene repertoire, but the most promising source of a fully, uh, are fully human antibodies, which are developed inside the human body by the human is immune response. So people use circulating B cells to get these human antibody sequences. And the circulating B cells are often selected for their capacity to recognize the pathogen or a protein thereof. And this recognition is done by the B cell receptor, which is a membrane bound version of the antibody, which the B cell will in the end secrete into the circulation. Or to be more precise, by a membrane bound ancestor of the final circulating antibody. However, the cells that uh, have still this Ig receptor on the membrane are not the final producers of the circulating antibodies. And in the process of maturation that is needed to get there to produce the circulating antibodies, additional optimization of the sequence by somatic hypermutation may occur. And these sequences, therefore, from the membrane-bound immunoglobulins may not fully represent the final sequence of the protein that ends up in the circulation. Nevertheless, it makes perfect sense to start here since the methodologies are available and monoclonals derived from these sequences are functional and active. The question is whether they could be maybe even more active. And that question is what we aim to answer with our pipeline. And uh, we're not completely there yet, but we have made some progress in the uh, last years. So, Instead of using the B cell sequences, we want to use the antibodies. So the actually produced fully optimized product as the source for antibody sequences with mass spectrometers as our sequencing equipment. Sequencing of antibodies has been proven doable, at least when using monoclonals. And the examples I show here on this slide uh, are done by us and other groups. And, but these are still using a template sequence for the annotation. And for a completely unknown sequence, one needs to use so-called de novo sequencing. But that also has been shown to be feasible. And here I show an example from the group of Joost Schneider in our department, where uh, they did de novo sequencing of an anti-flag antibody. I will not go into details. I just want to show that it can be done also without the uh, template. But for the current purpose, battling a pandemic, or in the future maybe any infectious disease, we cannot start with the monoclonal. We have to start with the polyclonal material. And the million dollar question there is, 
can this be done? And that ultimately is sort of the holy grail in uh, our line of work. Can we get a full sequence of a mature antibody from the complex body fluids? And the first question we have to answer is, can we access the single clones that are circulating in body fluids together with billions of their close relatives? This may be, uh, so the, the theoretically possible number of clones in circulation, um, which is estimated to go as high as 10 to the power 15 in number, uh, has refrained many researchers from looking in detail to them. And this includes also myself. Uh, some years ago, when I was looking for glycosylation of the antigen binding domain, we did not even try to look at the glycan still attached to the protein backbone, but immediately removed the protein backbone and only looked at the glycans. And it feels a bit uh, maybe like you uh, want to look for a needle in a haystack or a specific tree in a forest, as you uh, see here a picture of a forest. Um, and indeed, when people did look at uh, or tried to look at friable domains from serum by mass spectrometry, uh, the results they got uh, looked a lot like a haystack. But um, maybe by now we can do a bit better. Um, and the question then is, is this fear of looking closer actually necessary? So when we zoom into the forest I showed you before, you seem to be able to see even individual trees. And then zooming in even closer, you can see actual trees of varying sizes, and you can also see that there's some grass. So why do I use this analogy? It's because our data shows that it is like that. This is a raw base peak chromatogram of one of our samples. And when we look at the data underneath, we can see very nice charge distributions of individual clones. So it seems like we have opened the door to accessing individual clones, although the remainder of the path to the full sequence of a functionally relevant antibody may still be quite long. So now, if we go back to, uh, to now, we're not completely there yet, but maybe we can already use the tools that we have developed to contribute to the current pandemic. Can we use antibodies in another way than by getting their sequence? And can our methods of antibody profiling and quantitation be a nice addition to the common toolbox uh, to study antibodies? And we thought so, and that's why we reached out to our collaborators at the Human Milk Bank. And together with several other groups, we got involved in a COVID milk study. Now, why would you look at milk? Well, first of all, breast milk is quite an accessible body fluid. It can be collected in a non-invasive way. And furthermore, the benefits of breast milk are very well known. For example, that it can prevent respiratory illness in babies. And since we're fighting a SARS virus uh, with a respiratory syndrome in the, in the name, this is not a bad feature. An additional advantage of breast milk is that it can be given to non-related individuals. So no need to test for uh, potential uh, compromising factors. And th because this is already common practice in neonatal care, for example, when a baby's mother is not capable of feeding or uh, not available due to surgery or things like that. So in the COVID milk study, mothers were enrolled from all over the Netherlands. And this included 30, uh, 29 PCR confirmed positive donors, nine suspected positive donors and 13 negative donors. And donors were called suspected if uh, someone in their household was PCR positive. From these donors, we received serum and milk and the milk was tested raw or unpasteurized, but also after two different pasteurization methods, namely holder pasteurization, which is the current standard for treatment of milk, and that includes some heating. And the alternative was high pressure pasteurization, which is commonly used 
in food production to um, yeah, to to pasteurize. So all of these samples uh, we received were uh, subjected to a wide range of assays, including neutralization assays and ELISA's, and also our profiling method. And in this presentation, I will focus mainly on the milk from the first collection. And here I show a figure uh, of the, with a summary of the results from most of the essays. And uh, it's quite a complicated picture and you don't need to focus on all the details. The main message is that the responses are quite variable. Um, some samples neutralize the virus others don't um, and also you can see here that um, after the current standard treatment the holder pasteurization or hop the virus neutralization is in many cases drastically reduced uh, looking at antibody levels we also see large differences some patients seem to have a serum igg response uh, others may have uh, other isotypes uh, response and no or hardly IgG. And we can also see that there are quite some specific antibodies in the milk, which is of course great news. Since we uh, cannot replicate the actual antibodies as monoclonals, we need to have a source of antibodies that can safely be administered to patients. And uh, apparently milk could be that source. As we have seen in a previous slide, the antibody content does not drastically change after pasteurization. And that's also what we see here in a slightly different way. Uh, on the right, you see the levels of anti-spike antibodies uh, as they are determined by ELISA. And uh, the dotted line is uh, the levels of these antibodies in the raw milk. And then you see the uh, in blue, the high pressure pasteurized milk and in green, the whole pasteurized milk and these, those uh, levels are uh, pretty similar. And also when we look at the total level of IgA antibodies present using our IgA profiling method, we do see that it remains highly similar uh, after treatment, although it is clear that whole pasteurization affects the levels more than the high pressure pasteurization. So how does our data look if we uh, look a bit in more detail so an example as an example of our output uh, this figure here represents a deconvoluted mass spectrum of a time slice for three samples originating from the same milk you see here the raw or unpasteurized milk in red the high pressure pasteurized milk in blue and the whole pasteurized milk in uh, green and you see that the red line is generally slightly higher than the other lines. Um, and that's uh, what we also noticed in the previous slides. And you can here also see a uh, light gray, um, light gray peak. And that is uh, of a spiked in monoclonal of known concentration, which we use for the quantification of the endogenous clones. Um, so we can do this for uh, multiple donors and what we see here is that the profiles for different donors are unique um, and they're also uh, quite simple. So the patient one does not look like patient four which does not look like patient 31 and um, although there can be billions of, uh, of antibodies in there and we can clearly see that the dominant clones are only uh, uh, a limited number of, uh, of peaks that we can detect. So to include this uh, part of the COVID milk study, um, what we learned from this study is that we can, uh, we know now that breast milk, even after pasteurization, at least if high pressure pasteurized, is an accessible source of fire specific antibodies and of neutralizing capacity. And currently the Dutch Human Milk Bank is in contact with some ice makers to see whether they can make this into a nice product. Um, and then it needs to be tested 
how well this treatment uh, protects, um, how they currently envision it, is that, uh, for example, in case of an outbreak of COVID-19 in a nursing home or so, that the vulnerable population receives some modern milk in a frozen form. So uh, the intake will be slow, for example, an ice cube that they can uh, um, yeah, keep in their mouth for some time and that it may provide a protective layer in the upper airway tract. But uh, this is, of course, not our expertise. So when we go back to our expertise, uh, we ultimately still would like to get the sequence. And yes, we can visualize the dominant individual clones, but it's still a complex mixture. So the question uh, we also had was, can we reduce that? And what you see here in the top panel is uh, the whole sample uh, with uh, uh, quite a number of peaks. Um, and then I performed an uh, anti-spike antibody depletion. Uh, this results in the green line in the middle panel, which uh, goes with the left y-axis. Uh, and you can probably already tell that it looks a lot like the blue line, but there's also one dominant peak uh, missing uh, from the green line. And that is seen in the orange line. And those, that's an uh, anti-spike specific antibody. Um, and that goes with the uh, the y-axis on the right. Um, and so this, uh, the, now the challenge is uh, to get enough material because uh, yeah, you can see the right axis uh, doesn't go so high. And the challenge is to obtain enough material to proceed with our quest for the ultimate holy grail. Um, and with that, I would like to uh, end my presentation. Uh, with acknowledgments uh, to my uh, the, the people within our group who helped uh, with the sample prep and uh, data analysis, and of course Hans van Goudhoven from the uh, of the Dutch Human Milk Bank, and uh, all the people from the uh, from the other groups that also uh, provided some uh, great data in the in this uh, for this study.